fast rate resistant setting, the, the vast majority of those patients are going to develop osseous metastatic disease, probably 80 to 90 percent. What's interesting is that there's probably a group of patients, in, you know, as high as 50 percent, that osseous metastatic disease is their first presentation of metastasis. Those group of patients that start with osseous metastatic disease are more likely to develop more osseous metastatic disease in the future. And it's really important because that disease, in my mind, that disease becomes the new primary. Their primary tumor may have been removed or radiated. That's not the source of further spread. It's the bone. So that new bone lesions, that, that sort of new site of primary disease is going to be what causes the progression in bone to other lesions as well as eventually extra osseous spread of disease. And what's concerning is those patients can ultimately develop visceral disease, not just lymph, lymph node disease. So there's a group of patients that develop metastatic disease first in lymph nodes, sometimes only in lymph nodes, that have a very good prognosis. But it's this larger group of patients that develop osseous metastatic disease, particularly as a first presentation, that I'm concerned that's going to be the driver of their morbidity and mortality. Visceral metastases uh, are, are really concerning to us because um, this is a disease that historically doesn't start in those settings, except in the cases of, of variant histologies. So neuroendocrine cancers or really kind of anaplastic prostate cancers, those that make very little to no PSA, sometimes those patients will present more frequently with visceral metastatic disease. Um, small, subtle uh, lung nodules are a form of visceral metastatic disease that don't carry a worse prognosis than bone metastasis. So even within visceral disease, I'll kind of, you know, subdivide those. It's really the liver and other visceral organs, you know, that, that we're most concerned about uh, as being a source of early mortality associated with visceral disease. But that's a small percentage of patients. That's probably just 5 to 10 percent of patients. The majority of our patients with metastatic disease are going to present in the bone either initially or subsequently. And it's really that bone burden that drives, for the majority of our patients, the morbidity and ultimately mortality of this disease. Back to this case, uh, this was a patient that had, as, I, as we described, an accelerated course of disease from localized to bone metastasis. It's not coincidence that the symptoms for this patient really coincided with the development and progression of bone metastasis. When I see symptoms in patients, and they can be subtle, like this case, some lower back pain that might be mild, managed with an, an, you know, non-narcotic uh, analgesics, or fatigue, or other kind of you know, generalizable symptoms like, like weight loss or loss of appetite, I start thinking more about bone metastatic burden. Rarely will those patients have visceral disease as, as their primary site of metastasis. Most of the time, we're seeing those patients presenting with increasing uh, progressive bone metastasis. Pain is traditionally associated with that, but that's not the only symptom. In fact, it's probably not the most common symptom. And some of these other symptoms, to me, are really an indicator of that osseous metastatic burden. And when I see that, what I think about is inflammation. Those are all consequences associated with inflammation, either locally or systemically. And that inflammatory prostate cancer is ultimately what we, what we need to treat. And treating it both within the bone and systemically is really critical. You know, it's an exciting time right now in terms of imaging for prostate cancer. And we've been stuck for 60 years with bone scan, for probably 30 or 40 years with CT scans. Uh, we haven't really made a lot of progress in the imaging of this disease. And it's problematic because at the end of the day, what we are really measuring is an indirect measure of the cancer or an incomplete measure when it comes to soft tissue disease of the cancer. And so we're really left with sort of in the dark with what's happening at the sort of molecular and biologic level of this disease. Right now, we're at the sort of early stages of these newer molecular PET images with either Actiamin or with uh, PSMA PET, Choline PET, uh, FDG PET. I think we're going to see more and more of these approaches in the future. This is not the, the end of this era. I think it's just the beginning. It's going to really help us do, I think, two things. One, it's going to help us begin to start to subcharacterize these prostate cancers, not by their sites of disease, but by their biology of disease. And so rather than thinking of lymph node only, it may be 
you know, PSMA only, where all of the disease sites are PSMA positive, versus, say, one that might be mixed or one that might be relatively low. And then I think the other piece that's going to help us with in terms of this is understanding the impact in terms of therapy. These can guide and select our treatment approaches, not just initially for, say, a PSMA positive tumor, but also in terms of disease progression. What does that disease progression look like? Is there a different now marker that's evolving uh, in that setting? And so I think as we develop more and more of these tools, it's going to be helpful for us both to, to be more precise in our therapeutics, but also be a little bit more um, uh, clear in our mechanisms and selection of resistance that's developing in this setting.